Welcome, everyone. So my understanding is that we have um, more than a couple hundred people here. Uh, I'm Kent Daniels, so I'm the Senior Vice Dean of Faculty Affairs here at Columbia Business School. And um, we've got a great set of panelists here who are going to guide us through some of the issues related to the contact tracing app. Um, I'd just like to say, you know, it's, uh, this is crucial research. As probably everyone's aware, we passed 200,000 deaths in the US yesterday from the coronavirus. Um, you know, one of the key things that we've got to worry about is how to make the best possible trade offs between public safety and efficiency. You know, obviously, educating, um, educating students pursuing research are two of the very crucial tasks that we do here at Columbia. And we're trying to do it in the safest way possible. And we're trying to develop insights can, that can help the rest of society to make these trade offs as efficiently as possible. So, with that, let me pass it to Shifu. Great. Uh, thank you, Ken. And welcome, everyone. Uh, I think many of you probably are in the first town hall. It's great to have you back. So, I'm Shifu Chen, Senior Executive Vice Dean of Columbia Engineering School. I'm so happy we can do this second town hall uh, about one week after the pilot study. It's really exciting to do this. We have about 1,200 users on campus doing research, education, teaching, learning operation in these two schools and with different kinds of activity. And we partner with our uh, collaborator from uh, New York State and uh, Tech NYC uh, who are on the panel today to really see how we can see this uh, technology in action and being an engineer is really exciting <laughs> to see how technology like this and application like this is put into action and test in real world. As Ken mentioned, this is a critical time during pandemic. And across the campus and uh, working with many people, we are working extremely, extremely hard to ensure we have a safe campus and we have a safe environment for everybody to learn, to research and to interact. And uh, in these uh, two weeks, we uh, try to design the study with our panelists and collaborator here to see if there's any uh, feedback or design uh, lesson or insights we can provide to the state and to our partners to improve this app, which as I understand is going to be launched very soon. So which would be very critical for us to have a working and effective system. And today we have a very wonderful, uh, fortunate to have our panelists uh, from collaborator and uh, leaders uh, starting from the app design, user research, and our lead in the pilot study at Columbia and Professor Johnson, who has been working on this area for a long time to share his insight and his guidance. So uh, without further ado, let me give the mic to uh, Fad Ashad who is the lead of uh, user experience process and the uh, aspect of the app. He is with uh, Bloomberg, and, but he is volunteering his time and his colleague volunteering through, through the Tech NYC organization. So welcome, Fat. Thank you, uh, Shifu. Let me get this up and running. Thank you, everyone who's attending for taking time out. I'm sure you guys are super busy with things, uh, but the biggest thank you to both our Columbia collaborators for getting us to this point um, and all the folks who've taken the time to participate in the study that made some of this stuff possible. Um, as Shifu said, my name is Fahad. I um, practice uh, human computer interaction and UX. In this case, I've had the pleasure of having a ton of collaborators. Um, who have helped and pitched in, in, in many long nights. Uh, and this doesn't even count the Columbia team. So thank you very much for all of you that have made the story possible. Um, no good UX story starts without talking about what problem are we trying to solve? Um, why are we doing digital contract tracing to begin with? Um, if you think of an infectious disease, a communicable disease like COVID-19, um, public health authorities around the world are employing contact tracing. What does that mean? In essence, if one person gets infected, you want a trained interviewer to basically contact them and ask them if they could tell us who else could have gotten exposed. 
obviously for different diseases, the definition of exposure might be different. For the case of COVID, it's usually if you're within six feet of someone, uh, six feet of someone for 10 to 15 minutes, um, our current medical understanding is that that puts you uh, at risk, uh, significant enough that we want to employ contact tracing. Um, so if you do get sick, a contact tracer uh, would call you and say, who else were you around for that period of time? For COVID-19, this is super important because as we probably all know by now, um, there's a long period of time where you can be infected with COVID-19 and not show symptoms. And we're not even talking about those people who never show symptoms. Anybody who actually uh, becomes infected before they start showing symptoms is a period of time where they're unknowingly exposing other people. So amongst the main tools that public health authorities are deploying to stop the spread of COVID-19, contact tracing is a super important one. Now the problem with traditional contact tracing is it assumes that I, as a person who is infected, know who um, I was in contact with. So if, um, if Lydia and I grabbed coffee together and um, she, uh, and I get you know, a positive test. It's very easy for me to tell my contact tracer, hey, here's this person, please let her know. Or I can call her and let her know, hey, I'm sorry, I tested positive, didn't know then, you should go get tested. But what if we were standing in the Starbucks line and just grabbing coffee, right? And we didn't know each other. Uh, what if I was checking out in the grocery store? And I'm not talking about people who are coughing and, and have symptoms and walking. I'm just talking about people who don't even know that they're infected yet. What happens in those cases? This is where digital contact tracing is so critical because um, we could use these effectively mini computers, mini radio devices that are in our pockets to sort of bridge that gap between what traditional contact tracing can do and what it cannot do. Now, of course, the moment you start thinking of that, huge privacy implications come up, right? Um, how much do you track people? How do you get informed consent? You're talking, I mean, there are many PhDs that have been done on this and many more to come, obviously. Um, but what we, were, what we have benefited from in the past few months is Apple and Google building on work that's been done by famed cryptographers and other security experts came up with a plan that is decentralized and anonymous uh, that hopefully that, that takes care of many, many of these problems. It obviously, like any good trade-off, takes something away. But at the end, we have a system that uses low energy Bluetooth, and I'll, I'll talk you through that in a second, um, to try and create a decentralized and anonymous framework that allows for contact tracing to happen um, without some of the, the bigger privacy risks that come with it. This is what's called exposure notification service. I'm not gonna go too deep into it. You can just Google this and there's some really good material out there that you can see. But very essence, what happens is if you, and that's an if, if you opt in to this system, uh, uh, the system will generate a random ID on your device. They will generate a new random ID every 10 to 20 minutes. It's called rotating the keys so that uh, it remains anonymous as much as possible. So we start with your phone, it is generating these IDs. Other people's phones who are, ex who are also using the same framework will then use this low energy Bluetooth to exchange these random keys. So my phone can tell somebody else's phone, hey, I'm near you and you're near me by simply exchanging these random IDs but they can't be traced back to who I am and who you are. They literally just do random tokens, right? And when these tokens rotate, the other phone has no idea. So it actually literally sees it as another contact and will log it that way. So these logs are being built up on each phone saying here is my set of IDs that I have generated and only I know that I have them. And here are the other random IDs that I have seen that were nearby me. Again, that's where those parameters come in, right? But within six feet roughly, and about 10 to 15 minutes is when that log uh, handshake happens. And so these two lists are being kept on each phone. Periodically, the, these random IDs, the phones, like my phone, let's, let's start with my phone, basically says, hey, I'm going to go somewhere and I'm gonna fetch a list of infected phones IDs. And we'll talk about how that happens later. 
and I will download them. This is the decentralized part. I will download them onto my phone and I will compare them against all the IDs I was around. So I have no idea whose IDs they are. They could be this hundreds of people. They could be 30 people I just hung out with all the time, but it's just a list of IDs. I have a list of IDs that I know I was close by. Compare the two. And if, if there's a match, then I know I was near someone in the past 14 days, and that's the parameters we've set, that was the tested positive for COVID-19, and I should do something about it. And an alert happens, and then you uh, can work with your public health authority to see how this works. So at a very high level, that's how exposure notification works. But if these things are built into the application there, which is where Apple and Google, uh, in, uh, in, in their attempt to collaborate for public health reasons, put it right in the OS level, what is the role of an app that we would want to design on top of it? So the OS, because of what it is, can offer this in a, very, in a privacy protection way. It can offer low energy usage, so your battery life doesn't drain but it doesn't want to get into the business of each individual state or country's actual contact tracing part. Um, for example, at New York State, we wanted to use all the benefits that ENS provides to be, there's no location tracking, it's super private, nobody knows who these people are, but we also have very diverse, a very diverse population and has very specific needs. Uh, and it has a contact tracing program that's fairly uh, well regarded amongst public health authorities. So how do we take that real life people need, um, diversity, the system that already exists and use this to augment that? That's sort of really with the role of what we came back as a design challenge um, towards. So the principles that we guided, we inherited a design that had already proven out to be decently successful actually in Ireland who, who launched before us. Um, and when we started looking at it, we wanted to focus on how could we make it simpler and simpler and easier to use. Um, there's always trade-offs. When you start explaining exposure notification, even though it is very private, it is a tough thing to get your head round, uh, wrapped around. I can tell you that it took me weeks to understand, and I'm still learning new things about it. And, you know, I have a computer science background. I, I deal with technology day in, day out. Um, but if I pick my mom, who's a classic example of somebody who's a smart person, has a master's in microbiology, but is not somebody who really deals with technology all day, um, how much information is too much information? At the same time, I also have to deal with the Shifu persona, right? The guy who's super into technology, understands him, and wants to get under the hood and see how does this work? And he's not going to trust just because I say so. How does this work? So how do you balance this? Uh, how much... How much information is too much information? Um, and what's the cost of some of those misunderstandings? Not all misunderstandings are equal. So for example, and this is something that our Columbia folks will, will share with you later on, hopefully. One of the early findings we had when we were testing this in Columbia was that a quarter of the people um, thought that if you turned off Bluetooth, the application will continue to work. And that is actually not true. Right? So if you go off and you say, oh, I want to save my battery and turn off Bluetooth, and you think that you're walking around and you are getting warnings, um, it's actually not true. And that's, that, that's uh, the cost of that misunderstanding is high. There might be other misunderstandings where the cost of misunderstanding may not be as high. And so balancing all those needs out, um, uh, not making people think that locations are being tracked. A lot of people still think, uh, despite our, our clear declaration otherwise, that location services are required. They must think, oh, you're doing proximity trace, uh, tracing, so you must need to know where I am. And in fact, that's the cool part about this is you don't need location services to do this. So we have to think about all of these things and balance both how much of the design do we explain to people, how much of the model do we explain to people while keeping it really, really simple and easy to use. Um, I apologize, I've had to blur these screens because the app is technically not released yet and I don't wanna get in front of the public communications uh, that'll be around it. But just to give you a simple example, we started with something, we, 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 we split the onboarding, which is when you first launch the app, we have to get you to opt in into exposure notification. And we have to get certain permissions from them. And so we, um, after doing a lot of studying, uh, lots of user zoom testing, and I know other people will talk to you about this stuff, 
we came up with this uh, situation where we said, hey, there is a bunch of people who just want to get started. We'll give them some basic information about privacy. And they just want to say, yes, I get it. I've already figured this out. I trust you. Turn this on. There are other people who are actually going to want to learn more about this. How do we get them there? We'll try and do some simple copy, some simple animations, some simple illustrations to optionally let them go through this bottom path of learning a little bit more about the system, building trust in it. And if they agree, then take them back to that path where they can continue their, their assignment. So by removing a lot of that extra information and trying to keep it simple, uh, we were hopefully able to get more in the way of um, tracking. Same thing with the privacy policy. We've all been there, very long EULAs um, that uh, somebody has to go through. Try and keep a very simple one page, a list of assertions about what the privacy position of this application is. And there's a link to read a detailed policy that is literally, if I take a screenshot, you see this little bar here? That's how long that is. Um, but try and make it progressive disclosure. Give them the simplest, most important information up front and let somebody delve into the deeper conversations. One final principle I'll quickly touch on is um, other than contact tracing, there's not much in the application if you think about it. When you turn this on, you'll get alerts when somebody tests positive and there's an alert for, for um, putting in, uh, declaring to the app that you, are, you have tested positive and you would like to upload your anonymous keys. But we chose to add some other information. We chose to add some basic data like the uh, percent positivity rate um, in, a, in a fashion, in a manner that helps you understand what's going on in your surroundings and hopefully be able to change your behavior accordingly. We, um, we kept in a health log, a symptom tracker, because we understand that human beings have trouble remembering things like, when did I start coughing? Was it two days ago or three days ago? When did I start having this headache? What does it mean? So giving you a simple opt-in um, symptom tracker, a health log that lets you sort of record your symptoms. Again, completely opt-in. You don't have to use it. But if you do, then we can also then give you advice based on some of those symptoms that you enter and let you optionally reach out and get help if you want it. So building some of these other things to increase the utility of the application, knowing some of the surroundings was important. Um, Frankly speaking, we, there's a ton of things we could talk about, you know, how to make the app readable at a sixth grade level, translating into six languages, working on the accessibility guidelines. But the most important thing is that in the extremely short period of time that we've had to do this, we've been able to really design from data. We've got Columbia, who's gonna show you some of, of the stuff. We've um, read a lot of basic research that went into this. Um, so I, I leave, I'll turn it over to the folks who did all that research to tell you how we came to some of these conclusions and how we're building confidence that we're designing this app for 13 million people at New York State and possibly beyond, um, that we're on the right track and we're doing the best trade-offs that we can along the way. So over to Bonnie. Okay, hello, let me share my screen. So when Bonnie is setting up, uh, if anyone has a question, uh, we will try to answer all of them at the end of the presentation. And in the meantime, you are welcome to type your question into the QA box area. Sorry, Bonnie, go ahead, please. That's okay. Um, hi, I'm Bonnie John, um, and I'm a volunteer with Tech NYC. Um, and uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some of the UX evaluations of this app before um, it, went to Columbia. So uh, we had a, a very quick six week period that seemed like six years looking back at it. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about four different, what are called formative evaluation techniques that we used on this app. The formative evaluation techniques help you form the app. That's how you uh, understand what formative means. It gives you a lot of very rich data uh, to find out why is something confusing for someone or why is something easy. So we started with something called cognitive walkthrough. I'm going to go into what each one of these are, but we did go through, uh, because we inherited the uh, app from Ireland, as um, Bod said, we have something to start with. We could analyze that app 
very quickly and uh, <clears throat> do an analysis quickly, let us redesign some things. And then we could start doing different types of empirical usability testing with people. These, these lines mean, the, the dot dashes mean that we were designing and implementing a, a new prototype. The uh, light colored means that's when we were preparing or analyzing and the intense color means this is when we were collecting data. So you can see we very quickly went through many different tests and many different versions of um, the UIs as well. So let's start with cognitive walkthrough. So what is cognitive walkthrough? It's a method that was created in the University of Colorado in the early 90s. It's an analytic method, which means you don't need people other than the analysts. You don't need, you're not doing a, a study with people. But what it does is it attempts to take you out of yourself because we know too much about the app. We already know too much about the app. So we're trying to put ourselves in other people's shoes. And this particular method makes us focus on the user's goal at each screen you, um, and what actions are visible on that screen. What labels are people going to follow? And if they do take an action because they followed a label and hit a button, what sort of feedback will they get? And will they feel confident that they're on the right path to do whatever task they're trying to do? So the resources you need to do cognitive walkthrough are screenshots, which we had of the Ireland's um, app, and we pasted them into Google Sheet so we all could um, work with it. We had three UX designers that basically took four days to look at the most important tasks, which is getting it set up or onboarding and dealing with an alert that said uh, you have been exposed to someone. And this is the sort of thing you'd see on the side here. You'd have a screenshot. It would say what step would they have to do? They would have to swipe to scroll down here. Here they have to tap get started and this is what the screen would look like. So you're looking at every single little step. Um, so this came out with many, many results and several design principles. But because this is a very short amount of time, I'm just going to tell you one example issue. Um, and the, the, a pretty big issue is when we looked at this question about what will the user's goal be here? Many of these steps did not support the user's goals very well. And we can, uh, as analysts, we can, figure, we can say why we believe this. And as designers, we can say, well, can we do anything about this? Can we support the user's goals better? And what we could do with this particular issue is we managed to reduce the steps for onboarding from eight to four. And not only did we reduce the steps, but here you can see that this is a large amount of text and these have much more text than we have on our app. So um, we use this analytic technique to say the current one is not supporting user's goals very well and inspire design to be better to be simpler, to be easier, um, to be shorter. So that's an example of the type of result you can get from cognitive walkthrough. The next set, uh, type of thing we did was, is called paper-based uh, guerrilla usability testing. Well, what is guerrilla usability testing? It's an empirical method where you're going to actually test things with people, and you, but you're testing concepts with whatever resources you've got. Okay, so that's the gorilla part of it. So in this case, we had me um, as a researcher. I had paper printouts of the screenshots that we were mocking up in a, in a prototyping tool, but I only had paper printouts of it, okay? Because I'm in a pandemic. I can't hand somebody a phone or hand somebody an iPad and say, please touch this and tap things. I have to stay socially distant um, to even get these sorts of data. So the types of equipment I use for this is I had not only a mask, but a face shield. Here's my paper prototype. I did find out that if I printed it out as big as possible, people would be able to read it even from six foot away. And I have a six foot measuring tape here. Central Park benches are shorter than six foot. You have to sit on two of them. 
Okay, and I had a lovely assistant who made sure that the participants did not come closer than six feet. Very well trained for that. Um, we did uh, 11 participants, I did 11 participants over three very sunny days in uh, Central Park. Um, the second day was extremely windy, so I also had to have rocks to be able to throw at my papers so that they wouldn't go all the way across Shoot Meadow. So uh, another thing about this is I was doing everything. I had to play computer. I mean, I was playing the phone. Person said, I'm going to tap on that button. I had to sift through my papers and put up the right paper. Um, I had to take notes as well. So it was very important to me to have something, a pre-printed note-taking sheet that had every screen that they would see in each task where I could very quickly circle what they tapped on and what screen did it go to? And what did they tap on and what screen did it go to? And I had um, survey-like questions, but I had all the answers so I could just circle them uh, here. Um, you get to write down very quickly some of their reactions. What are they saying as they see this? But the one thing you absolutely have to do is schedule time between each test so that I can go away with this and flesh out all these notes while I can still remember what my chicken scratches meant. So this was a very hands-on, um, the saying is old school is cool school, okay? This was very old school, very fast though. So the types of results we could get from this was first, that a sort of a validation of the result in the cognitive walkthrough. We made this simpler for these two tasks and we did get um, at a scale of seven, were very easy. These people that we were testing with said that these two tasks were 6.7 for onboarding. Fabulous, because if they don't set it up, they, we don't get anything. Okay, and a 6.1 out of seven for these tasks. So that's kind of a validation of the design decisions we had made. And then as an example issue, uh, in the very first weekend, uh, three of seven people feared getting too many alerts from passersby. They were out in the park and they say, I don't want to get an alert every time a jogger goes near me. All these people who don't have masks on I'm, and I'm going to go to the grocery store and I'm going to get an alert because I passed by somebody without a mask. So this was a real fear and it would the sort of thing that would prevent people from downloading the app and using it. Um, so our response to it was to, uh, as Fod was talking about, our how it works section and uh, several other places throughout the app, is to emphasize that duration and distance. So we have, actually, this is an animation that grows, the yellow grows to show, you know, we have a jogger running by and a passerby, and the only thing that's an alert are the two people standing close to each other um, with an overlap less than six foot and uh, takes more than 10 minutes. So we've changed the app based on the sphere that we got from people as one thing that we did from this test. Moving on to the next weekend, okay, um, we did what's called Wizard of Oz moderated usability testing. So again, this is an empirical test with people and you have a digital prototype. It doesn't work though, it's just pictures still, but it's operated by the man behind the curtain if you've seen the Wizard of Oz film. Uh, film. You know, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, okay. Um, so it doesn't actually work, but there's a researcher who has a screen like this on their screen, and they are sharing it. We, this time we were using WebEx. So the participant who's at some remote location um, sees only one screen, only one screen at a time as if they were looking at a, a phone. The researcher has a script that says, okay, if this person clicks this button, the button says, I'm in, let's go, then where do you have to go to? And this tells the researcher what to do. They pick a, a slide from a drop-down menu up here so that they're doing, they're simulating what the phone would do. If it worked, it doesn't work yet, right? Um, we had six participants over two days and those people were from rural upstate New York. And I think we had one from New York City too because it was remote, doesn't matter where you are. Um, but we had, uh, we were trying to get people not just in Central Park, because that's where I was, right? So, um, 
some of the results that we got from this is we have a validation of the design after the gorilla usability testing. So no participants mentioned getting alerts from passersby as a concern. Remember that was half the people were concerned about this. Now we got none. Now I put, I'm a scientist, so I am skeptical of my data. But I put this word possible here because it could be that we did a great design, uh, you know, design change and people are not worried about this anymore. Or it could be most of these people were in a rural area and they're not concerned about passing people anyway. So it's not a catastrophe. We don't have data that says we did a bad design, but we have to keep looking at more data to find out if we have a really good design. An example issue that came out of this was that half the participants thought that the app was tracking their location. Even though several times in the app, it says we don't track your location, but half of them still thought it did. Some of them were not concerned about it, but they, um, they still thought it did. So the design response here is we changed the pros in the app, again, to emphasize that it does not track location. It remains to be seen whether this works because not every design response works. And I think um, Columbia's study will have some data to say about that. The next um, and last uh, type of usability test that we did before giving it over to Columbia was uh, what's called an unmoderated remote and cloud usability testing. So what you do here is, you're, is again a empirical method where you're testing it with people, but it uses specialized technology to present tasks and record screen actions and voice. Now, um, so this picture is, uh, this uh, technology is called user zoom and it works on your phone. And if you're, uh, you go to a particular link that it gives you and it says, okay, this is your task, set up the app so it could alert you if you might be exposed to COVID-19. The same task we did with the paper uh, usability testing and the um, Wizard of Oz. And so they see the task, and then they close this with this little button here, which takes them to the prototype. It's still a, a digital prototype. It still doesn't actually work. It's not a released app. It's still a prototype. And any time they want to get back to the task, they press this little arrow. The arrow floats over everything. And you can move the arrow out of the way to see things. The people who do this are called a panel. User Zoom hires people. It's like um, it's uh, piecework. Okay, or the gig economy, right? People uh, have signed up uh, and know how to give good think aloud usability um, uh, data. They're thinking while they're doing this, they know how these buttons work. And um, this was very quick because you send this out and it takes you just a day to get 10 participants. Um, you can screen these participants to a particular region. We did a lot uh, in New York State. Um, specifically, we did uh, also our, the commuter states, the ones that are close, like New Jersey and Delaware, um, as people who might come into New York, Pennsylvania. Um, it's a pretty very quick, get your data very quickly. Um, we also could uh, screen for ages. So at some of the studies we did, we did all ages, and then we really concentrated on um, 70 plus uh, years old because uh, they seem to have quite some difficulties in our paper prototyping. And we wanted to see, is it because we had paper or because it wasn't on their phone, you know, and it wasn't on their phone. So we looked for converging evidence that some of uh, the people who are older have some difficult problems with some of the assumptions about mobile technology. Like, do they know there's a back button at the top? Do they know that there's an X um, to close things? And so, um, we're getting converging evidence from several different studies. So an example uh, issue from this is that people receiving a proximity alert did not find or read the guidelines. So this is the screen that, uh, they, that they would get. The app has detected that at a particular time, uh, excuse me, particular date, you got, you tested, um, you were close to someone who tested positive and there for long enough that you might have been exposed. And here we had a button that says learn how to keep others safe. Well, in testing this, we had 68 participants doing this. 
a large majority of the people did not uh, te- um, press that button. So they never saw all the guidance about what does it mean to quarantine. So what we did from this is our design response was to remove this intermediary action. So instead of having one very simple screen with a button that they wouldn't press, (laughs) we gave them the same alert at the top, but we gave them all the things that they're actually supposed to do. So this screen is a lot longer, but to, um, to do anything else, like to find out you know, how to call to get help, they at least had this information scrolling past their eyes, like getting them to know they didn't know everything is what we were trying to do. So again, this is the sort of thing that we're, um, we're looking for converge, uh, more evidence to see if this is a, a good design decision, but it is designed from data as Fod um, mentioned, we're designing from our data. So now I'm gonna hand it off to the Columbia Field Trial. We did, uh, just to uh, sum up, four different types of studies over a six week period. In that last week, Columbia was starting to uh, set up their trial and uh, it happened the next week. And now I'm going to um, hand it off to the Columbia researchers. Thank you, Bonnie. Um, Before I take it up, a couple quick clarifications um, from the audience. First, was there any reason you did uh, in-person testing rather than finding participants online at the gorilla stage? Yes. Um, The problem was we did not have anything online that was suitable at this point. Uh, We had a couple of screenshots, but they weren't connected very easily. Um, and it was very, e- it was relatively easy to do paper-based. So, uh, because I have dogs, I walk dogs in the morning. <laughs> I have lots of friends who especially were older. I was very worried about um, some of the more um, uh, vulnerable populations. And I knew that I had access to a, uh, the older people who are um, vulnerable. And so uh, we could have done some of the uh, online stuff that the, we did the second weekend, but it was fast to do the very first one on paper. I got such good um, uh, responses from that that we did do a second weekend of it. I had also hoped that I could get um, people that I didn't know doing your friends are always a bit of a problem. I went out to Sheep Meadow and went around and asked people who were just sitting on the ground, social distancing, if they would help me. Uh, I did get several people who happened to be um, uh, Latino and Hispanic, uh, which was great because there's another more vulnerable population that I could get that way. When you're doing it more targeted um, remotely, You'd have to know people's email address and um, or you know call them on the phone, and that would only be people you know. So the paper base with my bag of rocks to throw at things and my paper and my my uh, clipboard allowed me to get to people who I didn't know as well. Great. Um, one one more. We're going to address this. If there's a quick answer to this, we can uh, we can go back. Uh, but person asks. You seem to have copied, you know, the, the Ireland app. So what's unique about this one? Is there like one or two key things maybe that for this population you would uh, have to adjust it? Why do you want me to well, that? yeah, go ahead. Bob. So you're right. We started with the Irish app. I think the biggest difference is if you uh, one, I think one even had a slide for that is sort of where do we ask a lot of those upfront questions? So we tried to make our onboarding as simple as possible and excise a lot of the detail from it and not make it through EULAs and, and other kinds of uh, warnings and notifications, which we do not believe in. We consulted some, some experts in privacy and usability um, and, and were confident in the fact that they do not actually add to the informed consent and understanding of this app's experience. And we sort of put them on the tail end and say, you don't need to ask these questions and just scare people away 
who already don't trust the system by throwing a bunch of words and scary language at them. And so a lot of it is in sort of those kinds of experiences rather than the specific functionality that comes into it. There are other things we had to do to localize things uh, to New York State, for example, the precise procedure for how uploading of, of codes happens and things like that. And what advice we want to give as on behalf of New York State, when I say we in this case, I really mean the medical staff at New York State wants to give. And those things are drastically different, obviously, between Ireland and here. Um, and you know what data we show and stuff like that. But yes, the basic framework, if you squint, and you'll see this, by the way, between our app and Pennsylvania uh, and, and uh, other states that are sort of you know, using the same basic framework, those things are the same. It's the details around that that I think is yeah. the, the big difference. Yeah, two, two really small things. One is that, well, not, it's not small, it makes a big difference. Um, the uh, Irish app did not design to a sixth grade reading level. Um, and so a lot of their language may not, um, I mean, 40% of the um, U.S. population uh, doesn't read better than a sixth grade reading level. So we designed for much lower reading level. Um, and the other one is, there's a big difference in the trust in the government between um, Ireland and the U.S. So uh, the issue of trust and uh, so we designed for that, too, in the copy that we wrote there. Great. Uh, Irish one people more. trust their government more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one more, um, perhaps for FOD. Uh, what, what does it mean that no participants mentioned getting alerts from passersby as a concern? Um, particularly, explain what you mean that the app doesn't work when people pass by or if Bonnie... Oh, that, that, was, that was mine. I, I should take that one. So um, the, the issue is that you only get an alert if you are within six feet of someone for more than 10 minutes. And the concern that people had, they did not understand that. They thought that as they're standing in the park with their dog, a jogger comes by and that person has COVID, they thought they were gonna get alert from that. And they go to the grocery store and somebody is picking up the milk while they're picking up the orange juice and that person has COVID, they thought they were gonna get an alert from that. So they thought they were gonna get like 20 alerts a day. And that was the concern, that they did not want that um, type of uh, app on their phone that was going to ping at them 20 times a day. But it doesn't do that because you have to be in, you know, you have to be close to someone for 10 minutes. And that's what we were trying to uh, convey. And in the second study, nobody mentioned getting too many alerts as a concern. Where the first study, Lots of people, half the people said they were concerned about that. I didn't prompt them. I didn't ask them if they were concerned about that. I just said, do you have any concerns? And they mentioned that spontaneously. But in the second study, nobody did. Okay, fantastic. We have four, but we'll um, wait for the end. And I will okay. start presenting about the Columbia study findings. So um, I think this should be presenting now. Yes, so the Columbia study was uh, looked like this timeline. Um, at the start of the week, we had 184 people install the app and answer some survey questions. And then they just carried their phone and used the app as they see fit. And then at the end of the week, uh, we asked everyone to answer the exit survey, uh, an another survey, and we got 82% of the um, original 184, which is actually a really high number. Um, that's fantastic. So uh, whereas we said carry your phone, use the app as you see fit, we actually had a couple things planned. One is on Thursday, we sent out 76 simulated COVID cases. So the people who had this on their phone, we randomly picked about half of them and said, you have this COVID simulation in order to test like what happens when they try to enter this? Um, like what are the usability problems? What do they understand about it? Uh, trying to find anything there that might trip people up. Then, uh, for all those people who got simulated cases, that would then look at or at um, who had been in contact with them, and the very next day, send out. Um, this turned out to be 37 exposure notifications. So that means that these people, these 37 people, had all come in contact with at least one of the 76 who ha had been simulated uh, COVID positive 
during these past three days. And they would get an alert saying like, you were uh, tested, po you were um, in close contact with someone who had COVID-19 for over 10 minutes within six feet. So that's the study. Um, so participants were all affiliates of um, the Graduate School of Business or the School of Engineering. 70% um, of them were grad students. Undergrads were not eligible, so we don't have to worry about the kids at parties potentially <laughs> not wearing masks and spreading things. We had a pretty good split between male and female, which is great. Uh, pretty representative sample between the two schools, uh, also nice. COVID is definitely a concern within this group. 70% of participants were anxious, at least moderately anxious about it in some way, shape, or form. Um, mostly either getting it or spreading it were the two things that they thought. Because most of these people are either coming to the lab, into classes, seeing, um, coming in contact with people that they know. Um, so two quick things, high level on, on the feature usage. Um, there were a number of things people say that they would use it for going forward. A uh, huge number said that they would use it if they got an alert, which is amazing. That's the, the number one thing <laughs> that we want it to do. Um, but people also said that some of the uh, just like features that were there to um, make it a little bit more fun or, or entertaining were there for, uh, so for example, there are graphs about positive cases in New York, nothing to do with you, just about you and your local area. And 72% of people said they used, used that. Following that with, um, you can log your health for self-monitoring and people said they would do that in some cases. And even 50% of people said they'd log their symptoms, their, their health symptoms um, for researchers. So, yay. Um, echoing what Bonnie said, there are definitely concerns about uh, privacy and downloading the app people. So whereas this wasn't as big a deal in, in Ireland, definitely was in the US, I'm sure what the government will do with the health log data or with the close contact data. Uh, another one was phone battery usage. This also was a concern in, in Ireland. So that translated <laughs> across the pond. Um, the, we then tested app usability of the features. Can people find what to click, some of the same things that uh, Bonnie looked at. So people said that the setup was useful and reassuring 81% of the time, which is great. These screens that explain what it is, people um, were great with that. This was true for people who went to the um, info session at the beginning and who didn't, so that's great. Um, the daily health login check-in was very easy, for extremely easy for, for most people. Uh, looks just like this. So that was great. Um, however, we did find that entering a diagnosis was not easy for most. So you start with a code, um, you then will get a screen like this. And if you notice, one of the problems is here at the bottom, it says enter your close contact code in order for you to get to this screen. It's pretty easy to enter the numbers into the screen, but this button had fallen off the edge of the screen for many people and they didn't see it. So. That's you know, something something we can fix. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good finding. It's a negative finding, but that we can adjust. Uh, okay. Um, and then acting on an exposure notification saying like you've been potentially exposed uh, was mixed. That's 62% uh, saying that it was easy to check and that it provided uh, guidance. Um, I think the things that Bonnie suggested absolutely helped. Uh, there's sort of always more you can do it. So a uh, little bit mixed. Um, I will now hand it over to Noemi, who I think will talk about misconceptions, especially those related to privacy. I'll stop sharing, Noemi. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna start sharing on my side. So, so we, you know, um, no, I don't wanna share. I wanna present this time. Okay, so so following on 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 what Lydia has described, moving on to some of the usability questions, there were a lot of questions we were trying to um, where we were trying to assess how much knowledge uh, and understanding there is about the technology behind the app and the concepts of of contact tracing. We've already discussed. I think Fad mentioned it uh, very well that it's it, those are very complex. Uh, concepts and so we wanted to see if the app was uh, supporting uh, any of these of these questions and so 
the, you know, there are many uh, findings from the surveys, but we're just highlighting a few examples here. One that was uh, striking was that location usage uh, was still considered by 44% of our respondents to be uh, incorrectly uh, used by the app. And, uh, you know, Bonnie uh, mentioned uh, that in her work also she had, she had seen that this was a, an issue. Uh, it's still an issue, and so um, we can go back to how, what should we do now that you know different designs are still not um, addressing this uh, this really uh, persistent uh, misconception. There were other misperceptions about the app functions, and uh, one thing that I should say, which you know the these these different misconceptions and misperceptions are potentially driving the um, the worries that and the concerns that users have for downloading the app so it's it's quite important to address them so in our uh, survey 33 percent of the of the participants in our exit survey uh, reported that if we were to um, log a, a COVID-like symptom. So forever, so for example, if someone said they had a fever and logged it into the app, what, what was expected to happen? And 33% thought that that would uh, trigger a notification, an exposure notification to the other contact uh, or people that they had gone into contact. Uh, through the app, and that's incorrect. Um, you know, the the health logging is a completely separate functionality of the app uh, that is there as an engagement technique, as a way to help the the individuals monitor their health in the in the effect of a notification, either of case or ex uh, exposure. But uh, that seems to be a persistent question. Um, other other misconceptions. Um, what happens in the case of an exposure notification? Um, we, you know, we we asked maybe a, a difficult question here, which was, uh, you know, what do you think would happen? The right answer was none of the above. Uh, you know, if you receive an exposure notification, because it's fully decentralized and completely uh, private, actually no one knows um, that you got on your phone the exposure notification, and so there is no such thing as a, a you know a transitive exposure notification. If you if you're exposed your contacts are not going to get a, a notification. Uh, a human trace contact tracer would not be able to call you because they wouldn't be aware uh, of that fact. Your doctor would not know and probably would not want to uh, because they don't have the time. But, you know, it's, it's quite interesting that, uh, especially for the two first uh, misperceptions, um, a lot of uh, our participants were confused, and I think it's it's really a testament to again the complexity of the task rather than uh, users not paying attention. It's those are very complex um, processes. Um, I think what was interesting to us, we had many other of those findings, but we wanted to finish with this uh, experiment that we did where we, uh, you know, of the, the different uh, simulated case, we saw what happened during three days out of the week of the study in terms of interactions between people. And based on, on that, uh, the big question was how many uh, uh, exposure notifications were gonna happen. And we had kind of like our internal bets about it. Uh, and I think the results have been quite interesting. So to remind yourself, uh, you know, basically for um, these three days is what was used in the case of the study to uh, figure out who was going to run into contact or who was going to be able to exchange codes that later when we sent the simulated COVID cases would then translate into potential exposures. And when we say that we had 76 uh, cases sent, we know this because we're the one who selected them. But the 37, we again, because it's fully decentralized, we do not know the actual number. Uh, and so it's a, you know, it's a lower bound uh, and, uh, and it's useful to know. So uh, we kind of did a, a small analysis at the two schools that we had. And I think it's interesting because we know that there's different patterns of interaction. So in both schools, we had um, selected the same ratio uh, for cases, so about 43% uh, 
um, in Cs and 43% at GSB. Um, when we had the, um, the reported cases back given to us, we found that uh, basically about, sorry, I'm losing my zone, about 19.8% of the C's engineering school affiliates um, received an exposure notification, which is um, quite interesting, I think, especially because, you know, we had asked in our instructions and told people continue following all the social distancing, um, you know, practices and, and continue following all the uh, everything that you would be doing otherwise. Um, same proportion of cases uh, in GSB, uh, but actually an even higher ratio of uh, exposure notification with 34% of exposures. So, you know, I think this opens the door for many questions here. Um, we, you know, there, we know for sure that there are different interaction patterns uh, between the two schools. Um, Columbia uh, Business School had started classes already during that week, and that might explain uh, some of the exposure notifications, whereas the engineering school had many different labs that were quite separate from each other. Um, but I think that's a kind of, of a finding that we find exciting. We uh, have looked at some correlation, potential association with uh, some of the questions we had asked specifically related to anxiety versus uh, towards COVID-19 uh, type of behavior, such as like how much social distancing do you do, how much mask wearing do you do, and how many people do you think you've been in, in you know, uh, around to around ways in the past week, and um, none of these except the I've been around with more people was really associated with a higher ratio of uh, of exposure. So to me, it's a it's a really interesting uh, fact, and and you know, it it to me it, it really um, emphasizes the takeaway that digital contact tracing is potentially very powerful tool for public safety. Um, I would not have expected, I think like, again, this is a population who is asked to follow very specific uh, institution guidelines about the pandemic. Uh, and yet, uh, and, and our respondents are all heavily for pro these guidelines, and yet there is a pretty high number of exposure. Uh, we found that the engagement features were attractive to some users, but I think the, the biggest finding is that this concept and technology are quite complex and in fact are quite new, right? Like the idea even of contact tracing is new to most uh, people. Um, and as Fat say, we're still trying to uh, get our head wrapped around all of the subtleties of the, of the processes. So all of this led to some misconceptions uh, and, you know, some of it can be addressed through UX, like Bonnie described, but I think we really have to remember that this is a, it's one intervention, uh, which is one of the, the weapons in the arsenal of, of public health. And so, really, we should be thinking about all of the health communication uh, strategies that are going around and surrounding the deployment of the app in order to facilitate um, removing these misconceptions. And finally, you know, obviously, uh, there are some limitations with. Uh, Columbia affiliates as a population for surveys, uh, and so studies on other population would be uh, useful. And I will stop here and stop sharing, I guess. Thank you. Um, something slightly different, but very much informed by what you did. And I want to thank uh, the DSI and IBM for funding this research. In marketing, we actually know that thanking your sponsors is very important. And there's another connection here, I think, to the business school population, which is many people who are interested in online uh, customer acquisition are interested in very much a funnel dynamic. And that's very much what this is about. How do you get people from A to B in an onboarding process? So there's a real connection that I don't think is apparent. We basically come from a slightly different but very similar place. We're basically saying that people don't really know what the trade-off is that we started with, the green privacy and the benefits of exposure. You know, economists might think that's a very well-known, very articulated set of preferences. We think people know they like something about privacy, they like something about customization or exposure notification, but they really don't have that trade-off. As a result, they're, they're going to be inconsistent. So someone will be very concerned about a COVID tracking app at the same time they have an app on that's tracking their location all the time. So you get this kind of inconsistency because you're just not sure. 
Um, we've actually done a lot of work where we actually do things like change what the default is and show that that can affect the reveal taste for privacy. This brings us to choice architecture, which is a very similar view of the world as much of what's been talked about in the design world. But basically, if we think that people don't know what they want, the way you ask them the question can determine what they say. And probably one of my favorite examples is a paper I published with uh, Dan Goldstein, who's now at Microsoft Research here in New York, where we actually basically asked people, would you be an organ donor? And actually had them opt in or opt out. Now, the interesting thing here is it's not just we want to show there's any consistency, because there is. 42% of the people would opt in, 82% would agree to be a donor, so they opt out. But we force them to make a choice in a third condition. That is, what would people really do if you made them think about it? And it turns out most people would be a donor. So I actually suggest their opting out gets closer to what the true preference is. And that by opting in, you're actually missing people who would be willing donors. Um, the problem is that take, expressing preferences is hard. I have to think about what I want, and that is difficult. So maybe we can make it easier for people. So what we did was sim simply, we noticed, and we were comparing this at the time when we started the Google app, the Google Apple app to the Microsoft app. And we noticed there were lots of differences. We thought the prototypes you were seeing for the Google Apple app, like the ones you've seen today, were much easier. One function was their name. Exposure notifier talks about the benefit. Contact tracer, I think, generates a fear. I, it almost says I'm tracking. Um, we were wondering if the sponsor would have an effect. So we did, uh, in one study, the CDC, which for most people is higher trust, or Google Apple, which we thought would be lower trust. We changed the way the for wording of the question, do you want to come in? And we thought there'd be much higher adapt, uh, adaptation to the left, the easier frame than on the right. And we were lucky enough, we're gonna talk about two very quick studies quickly. One is study when we had 5,000 people, a representative sample of the US. Now this is a study which we're gonna ask people what they do, not observe what people do, but it's great because what it gets us to do is basically a very large sample that's gonna emphasize differences in demographics and adoption. And the second study, we're actually gonna do something that's a much like um, what was done uh, by Bonnie et al., which is we're going to try a prototype and see what's done there. So study one, simple, is that demographics and particularly beliefs make it very big difference in, in, in adoption. On average, 53% of the population said they would actually adopt such an app. But look at the differences. And these are marginal. This is with everything else in the regression. If you're worried about COVID-19, you're actually about 10%, 12% more likely to adopt. Higher trust in CDC, we're more likely to adopt. Lower trust in the president, higher probability of adopting. When you included all these things in the model, what's interesting, it's political party sort of went away. It's these beliefs that seem to make a difference. And just to show you how large these variables are, um, we actually, do, I wanna walk you through a very simple case. What happens when somebody has all these characteristics? Well, they will adopt 88% of the time. If they lack all these characteristics, they would adopt only 18% of the time. It's a very strong effect. So bottom line here is segments matter. The kind of person you are will make a big difference in whether you adopt. In the second study, we did something, oh, one other thing, is we thought that exposure notifier and cocktail tracer would make a big difference, 3%. We thought that CDC versus Apple plus school made a difference, 2%, both statistically significant, but, st but substantively much less important than we thought. In our second study, we tried to actually do something that was closer to the kind of prototyping we've been talking about. Um, we basically invented an app and asked uh, 500 people on their phone whether they would adopt by giving them a set of designs. Um, very simple, two, two variables here. One is we have opt-in wording versus opt-out wording. What do I mean by that? Obviously, we have to ask people these questions, but can we ask them in a way like this, which is basically hit the blue button to continue, and it makes it seem like that's the status quo um, and don't enable us opting out. The other way of doing it is basically, basically you could say continue without finishing or have the gray button be the enable and would that make a difference? So how big of a difference with this very simple interchange? I mean, the text is exactly the same. The other thing we looked at was very simple, um, but let me first go to the opt-in wording. With opt-in wording, only 28% enabled completed the, the, the process with opt-out wording 72%. So 
So this is a very strong effect. The other thing we did was basically say, what happens if we do three steps versus very much in this theme of what Bonnie was talking about versus one. The information is all the same, but in the one screen, basically you see all the information on one screen and just have to opt in once. And we find there that basically 49% when there's three screens will enable the app, 59% when there's only one screen. So a 10% difference due to that. Um, What's interesting about both of these effects is they're independent. And we also looked at whether they differed between young versus old, race, political party. Um, and actually, they were pretty much independent, which was surprising that these interface design don't differ along these lines. And just to give you a sense of how large these are, party does make a difference. But actually, all these interface designs are large in the effective party. So just to give you a sense of, in the real world, these are huge. Um, finally, I just want to say where we're going is we're going to do more studies. Uh, we're going to use comprehension tests to make sure people are understanding what they're doing, very much like what we talked about. We actually want to do this with incentives, give people more money if they essentially in a simulation manage to, to make the right choice. Um, we'd love to talk to people about uh, the most how we get this to the most vulnerable, although the interesting thing I find is that our UX manipulations seem to be independent of the kind of people, which was a surprise to us. And finally, um, I think there's a lot of lessons learned that these subtle changes to user interface can have large effects. And also that's really important to test these. We thought the branding, Google versus uh, um, CDC or exposure notifier versus COVID tracker would make a big difference. Those were very small effects relative to the things we saw in the UX. I'm not surprised by fellow panelists, but I'm just pretty struck by how large the effects are in a fairly large quantitative study. So that's it. And now, Lydia and I think we're supposed to run the Q&A. Yes, and I have one burning question that, uh, that Fad is prepared to answer. And that question is basically about the trade-off of what should we do? Should we release this app, you know, six months ago, exactly the same as Ireland, or should we wait and do our own testing and release release it later? There's sort of a fundamental trade-off there between like potentially um, lives and potentially trust. Um, so like when entering into this whole process of usability testing, is there a decision to be made there. And also, could you just like release one version and then kind of fix it up as you go <laughs> the way software is typically released, <laughs> where that you know can make people pay for different versions. I've had, I think, 12 different versions of Microsoft <laughs> Word. Um, Fod, thoughts on this? Uh, so I think Eric stole my thunder a little bit, right? He, he <laughs> took his time machine out of his pocket, saw the question, went back, did the whole study around how important is it to test the, use, the UX of um, of this and, and um, there we go. So uh, the short answer is without, if, if I hadn't heard, before I started on this, before I read research like what Eric just presented and other people's, I would have been in a conundrum. If we were ready to go on day one, I would have maybe taken what Lydia you were saying, which is release it and we'll fix it, right? W what's the harm? Like the, the value outweighs the, the, the cost. As I've learned more about this, I don't think the answer is as simple. And the things like what Eric was pointing out where the difference literally in what the button you put on top can drop your participation rate in half. And in a application that is affected by the network size so drastically as something like this, contact tracing, we can't afford to lose half the people. Other data that is relevant is um, when we look at launches like Ireland, the vast majority of the uptake happened in the first few days of the release and then it tails off significantly. So people who are gonna opt in, opt it in, and you didn't get a chance to sort of reboot and relaunch, unlike Microsoft a year later and say, oh, I have new bells and whistles, no offense to Microsoft, but you know, now I can do transparency in images and go pay another $200 to do this. So, so I think your chances of hitting the same crowd after you make that first impression so, and, and, and is, is, I would argue, a lot less. And finally, this wasn't, uh, to specifically answer the question that Danielle um, um, asked, it wasn't that we held back because we need, I wish we were so good and we had predicted Eric's findings, but we weren't so good to say, oh, you, um, 
you, you everything else is ready to go and you cannot launch because we have to test the UI UX. No, that wasn't thankfully uh, the the answer. I wish I had that kind of power, but I don't. Um, the reality is that there is a lot of complicated stuff that needs to happen when you lift an app. It looks to you on the surface like, hey, here's the here's the Ireland stuff, and it looks very much the same. You have to get all the. We needed to make sure the stuff was open sourced. We need to make sure it's scaled. We need to make sure it didn't have security vulnerabilities in it. We needed to make sure that um, the the stuff that needed to happen safely and privately from a New York State regulation perspective was being done right. We had to integrate with Comcare and still have to integrate with the New York City version uh, of medical record keeping that allows the system to even be used inside um, the New York environment, right? Uh, because the part that I didn't talk about in the interest of time is that unless New York State actually gives you a little code, you cannot upload your phone's infected codes into the system. Otherwise, it will be open to spamming. So those kinds of integrations needed a lot of time. The communication planning for this needed a lot of time. So frankly, we have been literally running in like a week long, like every week we think, oh, this might be the last week we have. So just do what we can. In fact, when we first came to Shifu and, and Lydia and Naomi, we said, we're releasing the week you guys are going out. And these, I don't know how they kept the game face on, but they did. And they sort of just like went right through and do their credit, never turned around and said, guys, why did you make us work all night, all day? Um, and you know, not launch when you said, because there are all these things we need to get right. We are lucky that we have such great partners that we were able to test UX so heavily, but it was never a question of block the launch because of your UX. I wish, knowing what Eric just told us, that we could have made that statement, but now I will. Uh, but I think we're in much, much better shape when it comes to the usability of the app than we did. Four weeks ago. Uh, Fad, can I can I also add that um, when I first got um, you know uh, volunteered or I volunteered for this, Fad said we have to run usability tests, and I said we don't have time to run usability tests if you actually have this um, this particular schedule at the time. And so the first thing we're going to do is an analytic test that can be done much much faster. We don't need people, and then we prioritize things from that. And then when we had a little more time because of other things, we then went to the fast paper-based tests. Um, so, and then we prioritized things that we found there. So at every stage, we're doing the fastest thing we can and then prioritizing the most important thing to design and fix so that we are never um, blocking because there's all these other things that Fod said. And every time they give us a little, another day, I run another usability test, you know? So, um, and, and we're constantly only prioritizing those things that are gonna make a big difference for the first release. And we've got a long list of things that we will be able to do after the first release. I think Lydia is going to answer our next question, which is about how do we trust the app? I think that, that, that I'm looking forward to the answer. Um, okay, so let me read the answer in particular. And actually, I want, there's a technical answer, but I'd also like your take on it there. So first, I'll just read it. Um, convince us about privacy, particularly the concern that this app would not reuse the data points in the future. So one thing you could do uh, is you can, in the app, it's only using Bluetooth. So if you turned off your GPS, the locations, and the Wi-Fi, it would still work. So that's a little experiment that you could you could run. Now, that, that said, you'd only know it if you got COVID or got contacted by someone with COVID. Um, I do appreciate this question. It would be great. Whenever I hear someone with a concern about something technical, I do think that a great answer is to actually demonstrate <laughs> that this is the functionality. Um, that said, every piece of software, and anything that you can't literally see the mechanics of how everything works could be totally lying to you. Um, that's, you know, uh, you run that risk with everything um, possible. I do like Eric's framing that it is a trade-off between what is the possibility that, um, something could happen and what's the possibility that this could save my life or save the life of, uh, of somebody that, that I love. Um, 
or that or that you hate or <laughs> just as someone you're neutral about um anyway a- another part of this is should we trust this app in the future that it will not be used against individuals um so uh, s- s- some of the, the the similar things i guess what i would ask as a as a as a follow up is um, and this is something we're always struggling to understand when, when people have you know, a, a concern that as a, as a technical person, I'm like, well, technically, based on the specifications, that can't happen. Um, but what do you think? Like, like, what, what, is your, what is your concern? Is it that the, tech, the, te- the technical stuff doesn't work, that we're lying, um, that uh, maybe like we say it works this way, but there's always a back door into it? Um, and I think in, in some ways, this is where ju- talking to people, um, maybe an appeal to authority, like we've had several uh, uh, security researchers look at, like, look at every line of the code and be like, yes, so like, like, this, this is gonna um, work. So from a technical standpoint, um, that's, I, I guess, as much as I know how to say, uh, but, Eric, do you have any way of, of thinking about this? I, I, I would just add one sort of observation that might not be obvious here, is most of the code, at least I believe, is GitHub, you could see it yourself. It's actually, you know, you, you can go and look at what it's doing. So that I think is very important um, for those people who are capable of doing that. Um, because that transparency is one of the few tools we have. Um, the other fact is, remember, it's important that these data are destroyed. You know, there's an issue about, what, you know, the keys being ca- changed. This is built in. But ultimately, I think, you know, Leah is right. There's a matter of credibility and trust. And that can be built. And that's a very hard thing to build. Um, but we have ways of doing that. And those are two things I think are important is, you know, making it clear what the software is doing, having third part- parties bought that. And finally, you know, there's a question, we see it in the adoption, trust in institutions. And that's a much bigger topic than what we'll have time to talk about tonight. So if I can add on, and Eric, I think when we start to work with Fad and his team, uh, the first thing we have in that discussion is we have a faculty working on security and privacy. And immediately, as uh, Eric, you mentioned, the code is completely open source, it's available on GitHub, uh, every version and that is available for anyone who is interested in cracking or verifying or checking every, every line of code. So it is there. A second point I want to add is this uh, app by design is a very interesting concept. It's a peer-to-peer. So that means the more people use it, the app itself become more effective in fulfilling the safety features. It's not like only the market share, how many percent, what's the percentage of the adoption. It's, it's a quadratically, the improving the utility of the product. Imagine if you have uh, people in, in close contact with you and only one of the person has the app, it's not going to work. So there's a quadratic uh, growth of the impact and utility of the tool make it a very unique. So adoption, adoption itself is a trade-off not only within our personal decision, it's also collectively the impact on the whole community. Can I raise a question related to this? Um, as Eric is aware, we have a, a faculty member on the uh, in the business school who studied the adoption of a similar app in mainland China, uh, developed, I believe, by WeChat. And uh, interestingly there, they're requiring you to have this app on your phone when you enter public spaces. And in fact, my understanding is that a number of even private businesses in China require the app um, and you, it turns out a QR code comes up and um, you, you know if, if it looks like you've been infected then you're not going to pass, you're not gonna be able to enter. But what it means is basically there's 100% adoption in these cities. What do you think, um, you know, I guess at some level there's a concern on privacy, but at another level, you know, if you're worried about becoming infected, you'd like to see more contact tracing. Clearly, there are positive externalities for society in doing this. Um, what do you think the possibility of getting something like that here in the U.S. would be? I'm not sure who the right person for this question is. I went to a restaurant on the Upper East Side that was doing <laughs> contact tracing by hand, and you had to write down your name and address to eat at that restaurant. So you can do that. 
<laughs> we, or you can force it. If you don't have the app, you have to write your name and address down. Mm. There you go. Uh, yeah, uh, that's more opt out. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I, I'll take one half of that question, which is what is currently possible. Um, when the predecessor app, which was originally closed source, we've now made open source uh, in Ireland was built. Um, they definitely wanted to avoid any such concept altogether. They called it passporting, which is you have to show something on your phone before you walked in. And they took, uh, as, as would not come as any surprise to students of privacy in Europe versus United States versus Asia, uh, you know, they went the other way, the, the North China way. The app in Ireland, as far as I know, has no record whatsoever of even the exposure notifications. Remember, the app does not know anything about your positive status or not, right? It has no way of knowing that. You have to tell it that. If you tell it that, it does what it needs to do and it just goes away, right? You call it deletion. It's just it doesn't exist in the in the system as far as we could tell. And now we have the source code, so we can guarantee that that's the case. But even exposure notifications, it was not keeping track of because, to the dear near point, there could be some people who actually like that trade off between saying, "Hey, you can only come into my building or my place of work if you can tell me, have some assurance that you have not been affected by someone." One person's uh, privacy uh, violation is another person's safety net, right? This app still, as it stands, until you know, we, we significantly change things around, doesn't opt for the user being in control. There's a button in there that you can go in, hit delete my data, and everything about this stuff gets wiped out, including your exposure notifications with the app track. The app will stay there, but all the data will get thrown away. And, and that is part of the open source stuff that Eric and everybody else was talking about. You can go trust a computer programmer to look at that code and verify that that's the case. Um, Apple and Google, as part of their framework, have a button you can press on their side into the settings that basically wipes any of the actual random IDs that were stored on it. So to build a, such a, a system that can do what imagining, this framework would not be the way to do it because the framework starts from the concept of user control and, and, and of their data, right? And there's many sides to that debate. This, this framework does not let itself to that kind of a situation where it can assure the other party that you have or have not been in contact because you control all your data and it doesn't know any data that you don't share with it other than the random IDs and you can wipe them out. Uh, so it's a great question to have. Should we have passporting? Should we build those kinds of apps? This wouldn't be it um, for the foreseeable future. Ed, would you would you be able to comment on uh, the the potential interaction or the lack of interaction between the different features of the app, and so I'm thinking about the health log in particular, uh, where there might be some worries that you know the someone decides for their, themselves or for the researchers to track their their health, and then uh, have a diagnosis code. Um, what what's the relationship, and what gets deleted, what gets sent, where? Sure, um, I. I would not make an assertion that I cannot personally validate. So I will say I, my understanding as of this point is that no data except that is personally identifiable leaves the phone. That much I can assert, right? If it gets reported up, it is at a very macro level. So for example, the app clearly states uh, in its privacy policy that at an aggregated level, uh, um, the public health authority, which in this case might be New York, would know across all of the users of the app, how many people got proximity alerted. But they would not know whether Fad got proximity alerted or Shifu got proximity alerted. Like that information is only on that phone and never sent up. But the aggregate count is reported back up in a way. And again, people smarter than me can go in and find loopholes. You know, privacy always has this weird thing of law of small numbers and things like that. But as far as we can tell, there's no way of deducing your identity from the aggregated data that we are sending up for public health reasons. Health log is even trickier, right? Because you're putting very sensitive data in there. I would double and triple check uh, before we release this app that there is no way we're still working on and making sure that there is no way you can connect these two sides of the world. That information, as far as I understand, exists in the app one to help you keep track of things. So if you get infected, um, you can tell 
again, if you want, if you logged it, it's like having a paper notebook, right? If you logged your symptoms and then tomorrow you wish to share them with a contact tracer, it's not like you can press a button and share it. There's no mm -hmm. mental way of sending it. You can read it out from the phone and decide to verbally share it with somebody else. And that's the level of sharing that I know can happen, uh, old fashioned. And, and anonymous reporting happens. I will need to, to look into more than that. Uh, and, and I promise you it will be part of the privacy policy and the FAQs by the time we release this. Thank you. We have been going long, so perhaps we should wrap up if anyone has last words. We have My one question would be, what percentage of people look at the privacy policy? Do you ever feel for that, Fad? I would love to instrument it, but that violated the privacy uh, standard. Uh, of, co of course. Um, That's the problem. Yes. Well, all, all I can do is, and Bonnie and I had a chance to talk to some of the experts in this field, and we are comfortable that we have improved it by making it short, sweet, and, and stable, right? Um, and, and there is a long detailed one that you know, you know, you and I were just talking about, like we'll get down to the weeds of things. So there's a long one, there's a short one that 90% of the people care about. If you care about it, and some of you guys will say many people don't, like they've already made up their minds by the time you get to the app, whether they actually trust the app or not. Um, so, so yeah, it's, uh, my guess is surprisingly few people will read it, but our job is to make sure that it's accurate for the few who do. Um, and I guess in closing words, I just want to thank you for, for, for this panel, for all the people who worked night and day to make this happen and given us the assurance that this app is actually going to make a difference. I know one of the last questions is how many people need to have it? Um, I think she answered that a little bit with you know, his quadratic statement. It doesn't have to be to, you know, 3.5 million people, folks. So it's, the reality is if a couple of hundred of us start using it and we prevent three transmission cases, given the R values and things like that, it's going to make a significant difference. I leave the ROI discussion to somebody smarter than I am, uh, but it, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's not one of those things where you need, you know, fifty percent of the population to be using every contact alert that generates, every person it convinces to act and 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 um, get tested is one more that will then translate into many more quadratically going forward. So. Um, so hopefully this, this convinces some people to use it. And, and on that, Fad, if I can add, we were very uh, impressed by our participation from our community, from both uh, business school and engineering school. There was an extremely busy time for students to come back and for researcher in the lab. And we still were able to get about 20% of our participants and spending a whole week and one and a half of weeks to help us to finish the study and uh, join, uh, come to join us in this very interesting discussion.